Now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters, and we have three today. First is Dr. Alana Knutson. She is a senior fellow in the Public Health Department at NORC and the director of NORC's Walsh Center for Rural Health Analysis. She has 30 years of experience implementing public health programs, leading health services and policy research projects, and evaluating program effectiveness. She serves as the project director for the ETSU NORC Rural Health Equity Research Center and the CMMI Pennsylvania Rural Health Model Evaluation. She serves on the RUPRI Health Panel, the Board of Directors for the Maryland Rural Health Association, and the National Rural Health Resource Center. Our second presenter today is Dr. Kate Betty, sorry, Beatty. Uh, Kate is an associate professor in the Department of Health Services Management and Policy at ETSU's College for Public Health. She is affiliated with the Center for Rural Health Research and Care Women's Health. She has studied patterns in clinical service delivery in rural and urban areas, organizational barriers and facilitators to access to clinical and preventative services, collaboration between health departments and hospitals, and the role of inter-organizational partnerships in health services provision in rural communities. And our third presenter today is Dr. Qian Huang. She is a research assistant professor at the ETSU Center for Rural Health Research. Her work includes developing methods and tools to assess underserved healthcare areas, creating the Healthcare Resource Index, building and maintaining the South Carolina Rural Healthcare Resource Dashboard, and the Tennessee Multi-Sector Plan for Aging Data Dashboard. She has also conducted several quantitative studies on COVID-19 disparities in the U.S. and worldwide. So I am very pleased to hand things over to our first presenter today, Dr. Alana Knutson. Go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you so much, Pear, and thank you for the opportunity to share our work. I'll first provide a brief background of our center and then um, hand it over to my colleagues to share the findings from our research. Next slide, please. Uh, first of all, our Rural Health Research Center was established in September 2020 when the East Tennessee State University and NORC's Wall Center for Rural Health Analysis were funded as one of seven federally funded rural health centers. And for those of you who may not be aware, this is a four-year cooperative agreement for a total of $2.8 million. And there are a number of other centers uh, funded across the country, including Minnesota, South Carolina, Kentucky, Washington, Southern Maine, and North Carolina. Our partnership, the ETSU NORC partnership, um, established the Rural Health Equity Research Center. And this is actually a collaboration between the ETSU Addiction Science Center the ETSU Center for Rural Health Research, and the North Wall Center for Rural Health Analysis. Our center's focus is on health equity and addresses issues related to rural public health, health care access, mental health, and the needs of vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Rural Health Research Center work, uh, we receive funding from HRSA's Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, and each year we submit five proposals for which the uh, Federal Office of Rural Health Policy selects four, and we conduct that research then on an annual basis. Uh, these topics are selected to help provide information to the Federal Office and other uh, federal agencies on issues pertinent to rural health and also to support the implementation of good health policy. All projects focus in national in scope and primarily rely on secondary data sources. Next slide, please. As in all things rural, it takes a village. And we have a great team at both ETSU and NORC that contribute to the various research products that we produce on an annual basis. And this comprises our team. I would like to recognize uh, Michael Meek, who serves as the deputy director of our center, along with his colleagues at ETSU and my colleagues at NORC. Uh, as in all rural health research centers, one of our goal is also to 
contribute to supporting the next generation of rural health researchers. And we have uh, two graduate students that support our work. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, each year we have four different projects. Uh, this provides the lineup for our projects from year one and year two. Next slide. And this comprises our projects for year three and year four. And note that in year four, our current year, we are working on five different research projects. And this is in part because the newly established uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC's Office of Rural Health, has funded a research project for our team. So this uh, recognizes the four research projects that FORHP has funded, and also an additional rural public health research project. And with this, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Beatty. Thank you, Alana. Uh, as mentioned, I'm gonna talk about one of our previous studies, actually from year one. Um, and then uh, Shen is gonna give us a preview of a really exciting project we're doing this year. So just a little background. Um, in 2020, 21% uh, of adults age 18 and older, or about 52.9 million people, had a mental illness in the past year. And any mental illness is defined as a mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder. Um, and though we have about 20% of all um, adults, we see that mental illness does not affect all peoples at the same level. When we look at the data by different demographics, we see differences by gender, age, race, and ethnicity. Um, with longstanding barriers to prevention and treatment, mental health conditions remain a prevalent problem in rural communities. Um, about 20.5 adults in rural communities have had any mental illness, but many individuals with mental illness do not receive mental health services. So um, of those approximately 52.9 million adults in the US with any mental illness, less than half or 24.3 million had access to mental health services in the past year. So one of the things that may be affecting uh, seeking treatment seeking behaviors is stigma. And so stigma is the social negative social attitudes attached to a characteristic of an individual that may be regarded as a mental, physical, or social deficiency. Stigma implies social disapproval and can lead unfairly to discrimination against an ex exclusion of the individual. So its negative consequences are significant and can limit opportunities across several aspects of life, including housing, employment, social relationships, healthcare, and more. Stigma can impede seeking and engaging in healthcare um, mental health care and disease self-management for those with mental illness. Um, and stigma can have serious consequences for the stigmatized individuals as well as their communities at large. Now, a few studies have investigated mental illness stigma in rural communities. Uh, one study among rural Appalachian parents of children with mental health concerns identified stigma as the barrier to seeking uh, services for their children. In older adults, rural respondents reported greater public and self-stigma when seeking uh, personal help for personal problems. And uh, one study of individuals living in South Dakota found a great uh, gender-rural interaction where men had higher levels of stigma related to mental illness than women, uh, but rural women had higher levels of stigma than their urban counterparts. So given the potential influence of stigma in affecting whether and where individuals seek treatment, combined with more limited resources to address mental health needs in rural communities, we found it was important to understand any potential differences in stigma levels between rural and urban communities. So the purpose of this study was to describe the burden of public stigma associated with any mental illness in rural um, versus urban communities. 
and examine stigmatizing attitudes and beliefs towards any mental illness among the general population, um, which includes um, looking at differences by virality, age, gender, race, ethnicity, and experience with mental illness. So we did this um, by using a uh, panel called Amir Speak. Um, this is funded and operated by NORC at the University of Chicago. It's a probability-based panel designed to be representative of the U.S. household population. Um, Amerispeak panelists participate in NRC studies or studies conducted by NRC on behalf of governmental agencies, academic researchers, media, and commercial organizations. So for the purpose of this study, a sample was drawn from a mirror speak um, that was designed to support rural and urban analysis uh, using rural urban commuting codes, um, or area codes, excuse me, uh, for a measure of virality. So we targeted a sample of about 2,000 panelists, age 18 and older, with 1,000 living in rural areas and 1,000 living in urban areas. So, uh, to understand mental health stigma, we researched the uh, peer-reviewed literature and national surveys and identified a pool of established validated uh, questions. Um, specifically, we found a um, brief validated scale of 11 items designed to examine public attitudes about mental illness. Um, the questions were scored on a Likert scale um, with the responses from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And the items factored into two subscales, negative stereotypes and recovery outcomes. So for the negative stereotypes questions, they included, I believe a person with mental illness is a danger to others, is unpredictable, is hard to talk to, um, and has only themselves to blame for their condition. So these were the questions that made up the subscale of negative stereotypes. For recovery outcomes, they were um, questions including, I believe a person with mental illness can improve if given treatment and support, uh, feels the way all we all do at some time, um, can recover, can be as successful as others in the workplace, and treatment can help people with mental illness lead normal lives. Um, we had one additional question that we included in our um, survey to understand the um, experiences with mental illness. So we included a question, have you had or do you personally know anyone um, who has had a mental illness? And from the Amerispeak panel, they uh, also have quite a bit of demographic information. Um, that is collected, so that, that was already part of um, the, the panel data. And so for this study, our variables of interest, again, were rurality, which was um, urban or rural, um, based on the RUCA codes, uh, racial and ethnic group membership, age, gender, and again, any experience with mental illness. Now, I just wanna mention that we did not do serious mental illness, um, which is something we found in the literature that um, most of these studies looking at public stigma are looking at any mental illness. We are not defining it and, and neither did the previous uh, researchers uh, define any mental illness. Um, this is just to allow it to be more generalizable um, across the scope of um, stigma on all types of mental illness. Um, so the questions were uh, individually considered continuous uh, on that scale of one to five. Um, and then we sum those uh, to create two subscales. Um, for negative stereotype, higher scores corresponded with more negative attitudes. In contrast, in recovery outcomes, higher scores corresponded with more positive attitudes. Um, and so we uh, ran both bivariate analysis and then um, weighted linear regression models. All the analysis were weighted uh, with a variable created and provided by NOR to account for um, virality group in addition to their base sample weighting uh, for it to be representative. All right, so um, the panel survey yielded 
a little over 2,000 responses, actually 2,091, uh, with 52% of folks residing in rural areas and 48 in um, urban areas. Uh, there were some differences we saw um, based on rural and non-rural residents. Um, specifically, we found that um, rural respondents were older and that almost 80% of rural respondents were non-Hispanic white um, compared to 61% um, who were uh, in the urban respondents. Um, of really important note, um, both rural and non-respondents experience any mental illness at the same rate of about 81% of respondents had experienced either themselves or someone they know um, had mental illness. Um, and additionally, I think the most important thing to, to highlight is that there were no significant differences between rural and urban uh, respondents in terms of the two stigma subscales. So they did not differ on their negative stereotypes or the recovery outcomes. Now, when we look at um, the full regression model examining uh, the negative stereotypes subscales, there were still no differences based on uh, rurality or geography or gender. However, other covariates were significantly related to negative stereotypes. Older individuals had the highest negative stereotype scores followed by those who are 30 to 40 and the 45 to 59 age group. The youngest group reported the lowest scores indicating less negative stereotypes than their older counterparts. Additionally, uh, non-Hispanic black respondents had the highest uh, scores for negative stereotypes by, uh, followed by non-Hispanic other respondents, Hispanic respondents, and lastly, non-Hispanic white respondents. And uh, finally, respondents reporting no experience with mental illness had higher negative stereotype scores than those who had experienced uh, any mental illness. Now, when we look at the full regression model for recovery outcomes, we have fewer significant differences. So there weren't differences by age, race, in ethnicity or rurality, but we did find uh, gender differences where females reported higher recovery outcomes than males. And similarly, differences were um, found for experience with mental illness. So those individuals reporting that they did have experience um, had higher recovery outcomes. So the inverse of what we saw with the negative outcomes. So overall, rural respondents held no more negative attitudes towards individuals with mental illness than their urban uh, counterparts. Respondents with experience and with respondents with experience with mental illness had lower negative stereotypes and higher recovery outcome scores. White non-Hispanic respondents had the lowest negative stereotypes with black non-Hispanics having the highest. And females had those higher scores of recovery outcomes than males. And then finally we noted that older respondents had higher negative stereotypes than younger respondents. Um, these findings suggest that Black non-Hispanics and other uh, non-Hispanics uh, respondents overall hold negative stereotypes related to others. So addressing behavioral health access and stigma issues in communities of color can really help to address um, health inequities. Um, we found that stigmatizing attitudes and beliefs did vary by gender, race, ethnicity, and experience with in, uh, mental illness. It is encouraging that not only did rural respondents not hold higher levels of stigma, but that um, they experienced mental illness, um, that experience with mental illness was associated with both lower negative stereotypes and more positive recovery attitudes. Um, these findings could inform strategies to reduce public stigma among subpopulations that may hold greater stigma towards mental illness. And given the limited access to mental health services, consideration of such strategies um, could be especially important in rural areas. So we know that rural communities experience disparities in behavioral health services. So the delivery of and access to mental health 
services such as assessment, treatment, medication management, and monitoring are often limited to our rural communities. Given that stigma is a widely recognized barrier to recipient receipt of mental health services, targeted strategies could improve access to and engagement with services among those experiencing mental illness in rural communities. All right, I'm gonna stop share and... Um... Kate, do you wanna wait? Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, we have a couple questions to, to go over here. Um, Alana, unfortunately, did have to step off, but our first question, was right at the end of Lana's introduction. What is missingness? Kate, can you explain what missingness means? Let's see, which, for which one of the, let me look at which study that is. Um, Alana's last slide. Um, which one of our studies? Yes, okay. So the question is about our year four study comparing health indices, differences in rurality, missingness, and associations with health outcomes. So this is really looking at um, different health indices. They are made up of multiple, often social determinants of health. And what we know in the rural research is that um, often these are things that may be less common. And so if they are at such a small level, then that data is not available, say, at a rural county. So really trying to understand um, how these different indices may be acting different or may be less representative is really what we were concerned about for the rural experience. Thank you, Kate. Mm -hmm. um, our next question did you examine the data by profession? For example, farmers and ranchers versus healthcare employees, uh, other industries? Um, no, we didn't. So um, as Alana mentioned, these are, we have four projects a year. They're limited in budget and scope. So we were really limited by our budget um, to only include 10 questions, um, but that is a really good question. And I can, um, check and see if that is some, if we have a little bit more granularity in the data as far as what their professions are in that kind of more, um, the descriptives, the demographics that are just collected in general on the panelists. Um, but I do think that's a really important piece because we know profession um, can have an impact. Thank you, Kate. Um, <laughs> our next question is, is this study published in a peer-reviewed manuscript form? And if you want to talk about the difference between policy briefs from your center and what you have in store for manuscripts. Yes. So we have two uh, briefs. So um, for all the res rural research centers, our main deliverable to um, the office is uh, policy briefs because they utilize these um, for their own um, advocacy work within their agency and across the federal agencies, um, which is part of why these studies are all national in scope. Um, but we do have a peer-reviewed journal article that is this close to being uh, submitted. And so that actually will look more at the the end part where we're, we're looking at these kind of bigger models and, and understanding um, how all of the different uh, demographics have an impact on stigma. Perfect, thank you. Uh, there's some other comments here that we might wanna consider. Um, so one of our attendees says, I wonder if perceived stigma by others, especially healthcare providers, impacts willingness to seek treatment in rural communities where it's harder to be anonymous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see this um, and hear this not only with mental health stigma, um, with uh, LGBTQ plus folks, with um, HIV, Hep C folks, with addiction. Um, and so that is a reality um, that does face rural communities. We talk about this in some of our contraceptive work too, where um, yes, you're a, it's an anonymous patient if you're an adolescent, but if your mom's best friend is the public health nurse, you might be a little bit less uh, likely to go to the health department to receive services for that fear um, 
of loss of an um, anonymity. So um, one of the things when we presented this data to our Tennessee Rural Health Association, um, we had a couple folks from the um, coordinated school health who do a lot with adolescent mental health. And they were talking about um, how these like intergenerational families where grandparents are taking care of these children, the children may not have the stigma and maybe their parents wouldn't, but the grandparents stigmatizing uh, feelings may impede those adolescents getting um, access to services that are even available to them in the school. So this is a real um, challenge. Thanks, Kate. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really excited here because our next question comes from a researcher from Turkey. So first of all, thanks for attending our webinar. Um, so our attendee says, in research that they conduct with farmers and rural people, women tend to express their health problems more openly. On the other hand, men tend to hide it. I think the situation is more or less related to masculinity culture that surrounds men in rural areas. What are your thoughts on this difference, Kate? Yeah, and, and so that did show up, not in negative stereotypes in this, but in the recovery outcomes. So women had those more positive feelings about how um, folks with mental illness are just like us. So that can really speak to um, some of those gender differences. Um, I think one of the positive parts of, of this is the strongest indicator of both lower negative and uh, higher positive was experience with mental illness. And so as we see more discussion, even um, post pandemic about um, mental health, um, I think that that can help uh, lessen that because uh, speaking about it and seeing people that look like you, um, experiencing something that you're experienced can help to uh, destigmatize those uh, mental health uh, challenges and illnesses. Excellent. Thanks, Kate. Mm -hmm. um, so, Chien, do you want to go ahead and share your slide deck? And while you're getting that ready, I wanted to share one last comment from the from the Q&A here. One of our attendees says, my rural white mother-in-law laughed when I said, what about HIPAA? When she told me about gossipy doctors. So there is, I think, maybe a little distrust of doctors. Um, mm -hmm. Does that sentiment impact your research at all, Kate? Well, I mean, I think it 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 does, and it it speaks to thinking about other um, avenues of getting uh, access to mental health treatment. Uh, we see more and more, and I'm sure we all hear about different um, like technologies around better better help and other um, online services. Those do again have challenges with our rural and definitely frontier folks who don't have access maybe to the broadband you need for those, which would get around the gossipy uh, physicians. But I think that gets at needing to um, address and intervene with healthcare providers about the importance of um, being seen as a trusted individual for this type of care. Um, more so in rural because we won't have, you know, 10, 20, 30 different providers to go to for these types of services. Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, so we are going to have time at the end of the presentation for more Q&A. And for now, uh, Chien, I'm going to hand things over to you for your part of the presentation. Thank you, Pear. Can you see my slides, right? Yep, looks great. Perfect. Thank you. So today I will provide an overview of one of our ongoing year four project, a suicide mortality, a comparison of urban and rural rates. So suicide contributes to significant mortality in the U.S., accounting for over 48,000 deaths in 2021 alone. So CDC recently examined the trend in suicide mortality, including the variation by sex and age in the U.S., and they were increasing from 10.7 deaths per 100,000 population in 2001 to 14.2 in 2018. And then the trend passed a little bit, saw a downward trend between 18 to 20. However, 
in 2021, we saw a largest one-year increase in suicide mortality over this time to 14.1, which was a 4% increase. Demographically, males are at a much higher risk of suicide mortality than females. I just saw uh, comments in the Q&A and said that there are some cultural reasons a male uh, doesn't want to express their mental burden and will cause some problem. And di differences in suicide uh, mortality among racial and ethnic, ethnic uh, groups have also been identified. Uh, with the highest rates among American Indian and Alaska Native people in 2021. And while the study was very important and useful, it didn't uh, analyze rate by geography. And there is another CDC report in 2020 did look at the urban rural differences in suicide mortality from 2000 to 2018 and found that overall suicide rates were higher in rural, uh, which is 19.4 versus 13.4 in urban in 2018. And suicide mortality increased at a higher rate in rural areas than urban areas over this time frame, leading to a widening disparities. And rates are both high for male and female compared to in the rural areas compared to their urban counterparts. So there is a need for better understand the suicide mortality in rural areas. People live in rural areas are considered vulnerable to suicide, including uh, veterans, American Indians, Alaska Natives, people who are LGBTQ and farm workers. Much has changed since um, 2018 and 2019, especially with COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, though our understanding of trend in rates among and within rural communities is still limited. So this project will examine the variation in suicide mortality rates by geography and explore its driving factors, including age, uh, access to mental health care, geographic isolation, stigma, at risk of substance use, access to firearms, and social economic factors among urban and rural in uh, from 2018 to 2021. As a state level, we will analyze suicide rate per year, 2018, 19, 20, and 2021. And by rurality, we will use a rural urban continuum codes here. Um, for the county level analysis, we will aggregate suicide rate for those four years to explore the spatial distribution because there are um, the data are suppressed because of the confidentiality. We, we don't have that enough data to do yearly data, a uh, yearly analysis. And we will compare those rates with demographic characteristics and vulnerability resilience indices using multivariable analysis. We will also conduct some spatial analysis uh, to analyze the spatial pattern and do some data visualization as well. And the data will come from CDC Wander, uh, RUCA 2013 or 2022 codes based on the suicide mortality data availability. And the index is from CDC and uh, Hazard Vulnerability Resilience Institute and US Census Bureau. Here presented some preliminary results Overall, rural areas in the U.S. Has experienced, have experienced high suicide mortality rates from 2018 to 2021. And the differences between urban and rural rates vary, ranging from 5.35 uh, per 100,000 population in 2019 to 6.59 in 2021. And this graph illustrates the varying suicide mortality rates among HHS regions, the health and the human services regions. And region eight, which include uh, this line, which include uh, Colorado, uh, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming, along with region 10, the red line here, uh, comprising Alaska, Idaho, 
um, Oregon and Washington reported the highest suicide mortality rates uh, in in the study period. And in contrast, HHS Region 2 covering New Jersey and New York, the purple line here, uh, has the lowest rate with fewer than 10 deaths per 100,000 population. And this is by HHS regions. How about by state? Made a map uh, showing crude suicide mortality rates in urban and rural areas by states. And those two maps share the same legend. So we can see clear spatial pattern of the suicide mortality rates in the US. And the Western US, particularly in rural areas, had uh, elevated suicide mortality rates. And most states reported higher rates in rural areas compared to the urban areas, with exception of Mississippi, South Carolina, and Wyoming, where Wyoming uh, urban area rates was uh, 2.19 per 100,000 population higher than in the rural areas. So the preliminary conclusion of this research indicated uh, rural areas have faced a higher suicide mortality rates from 2018 to 2021. And HHS Region uh, 8 recorded as the highest uh, crude suicide mortality rates among all regions, while uh, Region 2, New Jersey, and New York has the lowest. And geographically, the Western U U US, especially in rural areas, observed elevated suicide mortality rates. So in future analysis, we will explore the differences in suicide mortality rates by gender, age, race, ethnicity, by year, and combined with rurality. And we will also incorporate variables like uh, SVI, break, socioeconomic variables, and access to healthcare as data permits. It's um, very important to note that the county level data have been suppressed for privacy issues. And out of 3,143 counties in the US, only 1,800 counties are available for the county level analysis, even though we aggregate, aggregate those into four years. And data are suppressed when counts is less than 10 and flagged as unreliable, when the numerator is 20 or less. So the policy implication of this um, mental health and suicide mentality research emphasized the importance of the access to mental health providers. It's workforce. It's always the problem we're talking about. There's a need to increase the workforce, um, maybe possible through training some non-traditional providers uh, to join the mental health workforce. and. It, we talk about mental health, but even though there are mental health services, some areas are still missing adequate coverage. And it's a solution, but it's not the final solution. And expanding insurance uh, coverage for mental health is also very important, as some insurance companies don't cover mental health services at all. And building a supportive uh, work environment is also critical. Uh, most importantly, we need to talk about this issue. We need to bring this issue to the public and it improves the public awareness and a perception of mental health issues. And at last, we would like to provide some resources for everyone here today. And here's a link. Some of them we already put in the chat, uh, the link to the two policy briefs on the public stigma. Uh, and a toolkit for mental health, um, rural mental health. And please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. We do have a couple of questions, uh, Chian. And early on in your presentation, you mentioned disability, I think was included in your study. Does that mean that, or sorry, you mentioned veterans are included in the study. Does that also mean that disability is included? Um, based, based on the data, we could not include the suicide mortality data for veterans or disability, but we can definitely add 
uh, the, the disability variable in our social economic, social demographic variables. Okay. Uh, the next question would be for both Chien and Kate. Uh, so for both stigma and suicide, have you looked at the differences between metro adjacent and non-metro adjacent rural counties? Because that can be significant. And I'm sure this has to do with the Rucka code numbers. That's a great question. So right now we are on the um, early, this is a, like a teaser of fresh start of this project. And right now we only have uh, urban rural, but we do use RUCA code. But in CDC Wonders, the suicide mortality data is still based on the RUCA 2013. It hasn't updated to 2023 yet. Uh, we will do um, by RUCA code. So it's an um, all different uh, uh all different uh, nine or the categories so we will do within rural and how about uh, um like less rural rural metro adjacent or non-metro adjacent and we will do it separately based on different uh, uh code category okay perfect um the next question is there any data that would be able to trace the availability of firearms and its relationship with mortality rates in rural areas? We are trying to find the firearm variables uh, and, and try to incorporate it as one of the social economic variables in our data set. And if we can, if the data is available, we will definitely incorporate, incorporate this variable in our analysis. Okay. Our next question, uh, does the response time or access to emergency services increase suicide mortality in rural areas? There are some research that did talk about that. So especially in Mon uh, Montana, we can see it's super high uh, suicide and mortality rates. And one of the explanation is it's far to the emergency service and the travel time is very, it's long time travel distance. And we will put uh, these variables in our analysis as well. We can do 30 minutes tra time, travel time to uh, emergency service and we will explore whether they're correlated or not. Perfect. Uh, and for anyone in the audience that hasn't seen it, the Maine Rural Health Research Center published a chart book on ambulance deserts. Um, so you can see visually how many, how much of Montana is considered an ambulance desert. Yeah. Um, our next question, and Harry Holt, if you're still in the audience, I might actually have you unmute for this. Uh, the question is, Another interesting issue would be the status of, quote, red flag, unquote, laws and their relationship with suicide mortality rates in rural areas. Um, I'm not actually sure what is meant by red flag. Um, Chan or Kate, are you familiar with that term? I read it in some of the research, but I would love to hear Harry to explain it more about this. Okay, Harry, I'm going to give you permission here to talk. Uh uh, yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, amazing presentation. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Those insights. Um, yeah, red flag is in terms of uh, this would be law enforcement or family or friends that see someone who is struggling mentally and has uh, mental health uh, struggles and be able to uh, enter the home and uh, confiscate or retrieve firearms for a certain number of days until that time of struggle is uh it's like an article 32 where you have a, a judge or a testimony or or some a, a, a judicial officer um uh that uh gives an order that uh, the firearms need to be taken out of the home until the mental health struggle has passed some communities have them some don't some states have them just different variations and it's just interesting to see how that might affect the mortality in uh, rural and urban areas. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I really like this idea. We can definitely uh, just did some quick search and uh, some state has this reflect law to, to do the gun violence prevention. And we could definitely add this variable in our county level, uh, our state level analysis. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Harry. All right. Our next question, uh, the data that was used for the study, is, are, is this data available by region and state? Is this a, a free to access data set? Um, it's for suicide, yes. It's from CDC Wonder. Okay, CDC Wonder, excellent. Uh, will future research include means of suicide as an investigated variable? Would be the mean software, like from gunshot, from firearms, is this one. Uh, we would love to, but we don't have that data. Okay. Uh, the data we use is from CDC Wonder, public available data, and we can only uh, do it by ICD code, ICD-10 code, and it's a type of, but we don't have the means of suicide. We would love to do the analysis about the means of the suicide, but uh, it's we just can't find the data. Okay. Um, our next question is about the suicide mortality rate. Would it be appropriate to compute the age-adjusted suicide mortality rate? How would an age-adjusted rate impact your study? That's great. So in CDC Wonder, they do have an age-adjusted suicide rate, but it's not available by specific geographic level. So if we, um, in, in our different level analysis, we will consider to compute age-adjusted suicide mortality rate in our, uh, in our study. Okay. Uh, all right, we do have a few more questions here. Um, what are your thoughts on how this relates to deaths of despair? Uh, I know that's a general question, but suicide is an important component. How do we connect suicide mortality to the concept of despair? Concept of despair? Uh, you may the concept I guess, of- I guess, how would you operationalize despair? How is that something you can define to study suicide mortality? That's a great question. It's like about the disparity. What's the, oh. Despair. So the diseases of despair, um, you know, the, that work has been really important in identifying the challenges that rural and white males are facing. And so I think looking at um, some of those SVIs and the things that are looking at economic outcomes, um, as well as health outcomes around um, overdose uh, related uh, cirrhosis of the liver, those I think are really important. Um, our teams have been talking about how, you know, some of our communities don't have those high levels of certain diseases of despair, but still have really high um, mortality rates, um, especially among farmers and ag folks. And so there's been some uh, work that Alana shared, um, I wish she was here to, to plug it back in, from uh, the USDA and the ag department who are really working to identify how to prevent suicide in those communities. Um, but I do think that it is really connected. And uh, one of the exciting things about this project is that this is being done now post uh, 2020 COVID. And so we're we're getting to understand the changes that have happened um, as a result or directly or indirectly from the pandemic, which might speak to some of those um, diseases of despair as well. Yeah, I agree. So the, uh, I, I agree the suicide is a, could be a very important piece or the result connected to the deaths of the despair. And those could definitely be combined or be a part of it. Uh, and it could 
if I saw it's a dissertation question and it would be interesting to explore the mixed method study, you can, or just a, a, some quant piece, connect them, them together. That would be a very interesting study. Thank you. Uh, our next question also has to do with the mortal suicide mortality rates. Did that analysis include pregnancy or postpartum status? Was that data available? That's a great question. Um, it's interesting. We found a lot of, um, if we compare male and male and female, actually male is higher than female. Uh, and especially middle age white male has a very high suicide mortality rate compared with other groups. And we may not, uh, like in current stages, we may not include this in our study, but this is definitely a topic deserve a lot of attention and uh, we will love to do it for our future studies. Okay, great. Our next question, have you researched the benefits of offering incentives to mental mental health care workforce to stay and work in rural areas? This seems like a workforce question and workforce questions we generally ask the, the researchers over at the Washington State Research Center, WAMI. Uh, but she or Kate, if you have any, any answer for that. Uh, so we have not as part of this work, but I think you're getting on a really important um, topic. We do, uh, East Tennessee State University does have a medical school that particularly their mission is family medicine for rural. And they have programs that seek out uh, high school students in rural communities to kind of be a feeder program. And so I could see how um, that could just be extended to additional uh, mental health service providers to keep them in rural areas. Um, there are the programs that allow folks uh, to get their loans repaid, but we know that unless somebody has a real close tie to that area or um, communities like that, they're likely to leave shortly thereafter um, to go to a suburban or urban area. So really the pipeline for the rural um, healthcare and mental health care uh, workforce is going to be critical to address these needs and getting innovative, as you mentioned, incentives, um, starting out identifying homegrown talent, I think are all really important ways to keep folks um, who are passionate about rural communities um, in those places, but then we also have to provide um, opportunities for them that allow them to be able to practice. I think that's another challenge. If you only have so few providers, be it OBGYNs or mental health providers, they just don't ever get to be off. They may not have colleagues to bounce ideas off of. So really getting um, innovative, creating networks um, for them, I think all play a really important role. But we have not done that research. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, our next question has to do with the the breakdown for ages in the study. Was there a breakdown on suicide, suicide mortality rates for age, teenagers with mental health that's diagnosed or undiagnosed? Um, how did the age breakdown work? That's a great question. So um, as I mentioned, it's actually it's the middle age 45 to 64, they are the highest for uh, suicide mortality rates in 2000 to 2020. And they are around, sometimes it's between eight to 10 um, per 100,000 individuals. And teenagers actually, like the lowest actually is 10 to 14 and 15 to 24. It's the lowest suicide rate. And then, uh, the second highest is 25 to 44. Those are like all working adults. Uh, yeah, and teenagers has the lowest. Okay. Our, our next question um, is pretty interesting here. Some states such as Minnesota are actively working to pass legislation that would make medically assisted suicide legal. How would something like that uh, be incorporated into future studies? 
if possible. This is very interesting. Um, so uh, right now we are only consider like social economic variables or those um, social vulnerability or resilience index, or the relationship, the driving factors of this. But I do think policy, uh, laws, those like political reasons are a very important piece as well. Uh, if this one it passes the legislation or those like, or we just mentioned the red flag laws, those can all be considered as policy variables. And we could do some uh, binary, add some binary variables if this community has this related policy we can uh, flag as one and we can do some dummy variable and put this variable into the suicide mortality analysis and see whether they're related. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Great. Um, so we're gonna do one last question here, but first I wanna remind everyone that if you are subscribed to Gateway's email listserv, you will be notified when these new publications are released. So I know Kate mentioned a journal article coming out, and then when the final product for the Suicide Mortality Project is out, that will be released through Gateway. So make sure you're signed up so you don't miss any research. And I do wanna to get to this last question here. Um, it seems that researchers are using a binary approach to gender, either male or female. I'm sure that's you know a restriction by the data set you're using. Um, when there are many people who don't identify this way, are there any efforts to be more inclusive in gathering data, maybe simply letting people state their gender rather than limiting to two choices? So as researchers, how do you approach that? That's a great question. We always talk about uh, data quality. And this is CDC Wonder data, and they only have male or female, those two choices. This is something we cannot uh, achieve based on those public available secondary data. Uh, if we do like a qualitative research, we send a survey out and fill those out, that could work, but this is hard to achieve, achieve at this moment and by ourselves. Yeah, I think this is something that um, I personally think is an important question and an important part of our data. Um, but with a lot of, with large secondary data sets, we need to move that forward and ask for that. The census is now becoming more inclusive in their questions. There's some really great resources um, through NIH on how to ask questions that are uh, more inclusive of uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. And I think we all should be striving to include more inclusive questions. Um, at this time, we're still limited to this uh, bifurcation of gender that we find in the data sources that we have now. But as uh, Shen mentioned in our research that we do, where we're being the primary data collectors, I think it's an important um, especially when we're looking at uh, issues related to uh, rural individuals who may identify um, outside of the binary genders um, because they may have unique uh, challenges, especially as it relates to mental health and suicide ideation. So a great question. I think we all should be really working to move research and surveillance data forward in, in a more inclusive way. Thanks, Kate. Uh, I did put a link into the chat where you can sign up for Gateway's research alerts. Uh, you'll also be notified when the recording of this webinar is posted. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording, the transcript, and the slides. So if you're looking for the slide deck, make sure you're signed up for Gateway. That should be available by this Friday. And I did want to do a quick shout out. If you're interested in more LGBTQ plus health research, check out the University of Minnesota Rural Health Research Center. They have published a lot of incredible uh, research on that topic. So it is one o'clock. I want to thank our presenters for being here. Thank, thank you to our audience for submitting such great questions. And I hope to see everyone at future Gateway webinars. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.